glass or something. Nice. Questa fosse l'altra categoria. Ma che l'altra? No, c'è. Ti devo interpretare un po'. Ok, please take your seat. All right, I would like to, to thank Matt that Gracious. Uh, not working, sorry. Thanks, Paolo. So this morning, we discussed cosmology and some of the fine-tuning problems uh, which seem to exist in our, in our universe. Specifically, we talked about the horizon problem and the flatness problem or the curvature problem. Um, so the most widely accepted explanation for those tunings, for those puzzles, uh, is inflation. So in this lecture, we'll talk about inflation um, as a solution to the horizon and flatness problems, <coughs> and also as a mechanism for generating the perturbations that we observe on large scales. Actually, on all scales, but in particular on large scales, where they're easy to test. So first of all, what is inflation? Um, well, we talked about uh, this morning how when uh, W, the equation of state, is less than minus a third, then uh, the expansion of the universe accelerates. So one of Einstein's equations says, um, that if rho plus 3p is uh, less than zero, then a double dot is positive, and the expansion of the universe will accelerate. There's a constant there. Um, <clears throat> so um, what is inflation? It's a period in which uh, the expansion of the universe accelerates. So it's a period in which w is actually close to minus one. Let's write it as minus one plus delta where delta is greater than zero, and it's of order a few percent, something like 0.05-ish. Its exact value um, won't be so important. Um, so uh, if you recall, um, energy densities <coughs> redshift like A uh, to the minus three, one plus W, so for example, with w equals zero, like a to the minus three. And so uh, with w minus one plus delta, um, then we have a to the minus three delta, with again, delta close to zero. So um, the energy density of inflation, so this is rho inflation, does decrease as the universe expands, but it does so slowly, much more slowly than any form of ordinary matter or radiation. Okay, so that's more or less what inflation is. It's a period of exponential expansion um, characterized by some small parameter. Now, 
People don't normally uh, write a power law dependence like this because they don't assume that W is a constant, and we won't assume that. So rather than writing um, the scale factor as a power of t, let me write it as follows. I'll write a of t as some initial a at the beginning of inflation times e to the h t minus t initial. And um, if h were exactly constant, this would be de Sitter space time. This would be the solution to Einstein's equations with purely vacuum energy, with a vacuum energy which doesn't change at all. So it's like delta equals zero. All right, so h dot equals zero. That's like delta equals zero. That's w equals minus one. Um, but uh, I'm not going to assume h dot is zero. In fact, I'm going to assume it's not zero, but small. In fact, specifically, I'll assume that h dot over h squared is small. So what does this mean? It means that the change in h with respect to time, h dot, over uh, roughly one Hubble time isn't very large. Okay, so if you, if you have um, h at some time and you wait a Hubble time, the fractional change in h will be small. Okay, that's what this, that's what this equation means. All right, so, so, so that's what inflation is. Inflation is a quasi-exponential expansion where uh, the scale factor is e to the ht, but h is gradually decreasing. So it's not quite exponential. Um, it's, of course, accelerating, um, as long as this derivative is small. Um, <clears throat> so this will be a period of accelerated expansion. Now let's see what happens to uh, the particle horizon. So if you recall the particle horizon satisfied this equation. So this is the equation for a null geodesic. So it's the trajectory that a massless particle would follow. Um, and let's integrate this from some initial time when uh, inflation has begun, and this is the scale factor, up to some time t. So if we do this integral, and let me put a, an i subscript on h here, i for inflation. Um, get this, which I can rewrite. where n of t is just h t minus t initial. n is called the number of e-folds because um, <coughs> uh, as n increases, um, a, in, a gets multiplied by e. Okay, so it's like rather than doubling a, you multiply it by e. So it's an e-fold. So n is the number of e-folds. And since h is almost constant, n increases roughly linearly with time. So as soon as n gets bigger than one or two, we can neglect this term, and we find simply one over aihi. In other words, this co-moving particle horizon barely moves during inflation. It increases a little bit, and then it just freezes in place. This is very different from the situation with radiation domination or matter domination or any kind of decelerated phase of the universe where the co-moving particle horizon grows without bound. Here instead, it approaches this uh, maximum value. So in co-moving coordinates, light barely moves during de Sitter expansion. Um, you might be interested though in what does this mean physically, what happens to the physical distance. So the physical particle horizon is A times delta R. And so that goes as e to the n over a i h i, actually just over h i. So um, the physical particle horizon is initially one over h, as usual. But as time passes and n increases, it grows exponentially. 
So put in very simple terms, what's happening is that inflation is blowing up the universe. It's making the universe expand so rapidly that light, just like everything else, gets carried along with the Hubble flow. So even something moving at the speed of light effectively doesn't move in these co-moving coordinates. It's effectively frozen. Remember, the co-moving coordinates are the ones, these are co-moving coordinates. Right, so the, the um, um, you're measuring it in, in, these, in these units without taking into account the scaling uh, of this space. So this is, let's say, a zero, this is pi, this is still zero, this is still pi. So light barely moves in these coordinates because the space is expanding so rapidly that there's more and more distance to cover if you want to move a distance pi or something and come up in coordinates. Okay, so light is just frozen in these, in these coordinates. Um, but, uh, but this horizon is growing exponentially in the physical coordinates because the space is. So what inflation does is it takes an initial Hubble patch of size one over HI and it blows it up into an exponentially huge region. And you can imagine that this might solve the flatness and horizon problems because the flatness and horizon problems were why there are so many independent horizon volumes in our past and why those horizon volumes look so similar and look so flat. Well, if in fact there weren't so many, maybe there was only one, then you can understand why they all look the same. It's because really they're all just coming from one uh, initial patch. So let's see if that can work. <coughs> the way we express the flatness problem, we said we know that omega k today is less than about 10 to the minus 2. And if we extrapolate this back very far in time, um, uh, we discovered that this means that omega k in the past, so at some early time t initial, has to be extremely small, 10 to the minus 60, if we go back to the Planck time. Well, how can we explain why this number is so small? There was no easy explanation without inflation. You just had to put it in by hand. Let's see what happens if there's a period of inflation. Well, omega k is uh, k over a h squared. And during inflation, h is roughly constant, um, and uh, a grows exponentially. So, um, uh, so this becomes a initial to the n. And so omega k goes like e to the minus 2n. It decreases exponentially. So it's not hard to explain why omega k is small, at least not if n can be reasonably large. Um, and we'll, we'll see in a minute exactly how large it needs to be. Okay, so we can make omega k small, even if it was order one to begin with, this is its value to begin with. <coughs> if it's order one to begin with, we can make it small by just having large enough n. And physically what's going on, well remember that you can think of omega k as the square of the ratio of the radius of the universe to the Hubble, to the Hubble length. Right? So this is the radius of the universe divided by the radius of one Hubble patch squared. So the reason this, uh, sorry, the minus two, I wrote it upside down. So the reason this goes to zero um, is that the radius of the universe is blowing up exponentially because inflation is making the space get larger and larger. A goes as, again as e to the n. Um, <clears throat> well, nothing happens to the radius of a Hubble patch. H is uh, more or less constant. Okay, so, so, um, so that's what's happening physically. Now how big does, uh, does n need to be? Um, well, so let, let's say that omega k initially 
is about order one. Um, then if we want uh, omega k now, sorry, let's put absolute values here. If we want omega k now to be less than one, then we need this quantity to be greater than one. <clears throat> this is one over omega k now. Um, <coughs> Uh, times omega k then. So we need this quantity to be larger than one. So how big is this? Well, how big is this? So uh, I can write a naught as a i, so that was the scale factor at the beginning of inflation at t equals t i, times e to the n, so that's the scale factor at the end of inflation, times a naught over a E, just equal to this. Okay, so I've just written A naught multiplied by and divided by A E. Um, now, um, now, what is A naught over A E? Well, I forgot to mention it this morning um, that when you have uh, a gas of radiation in the universe in thermal equilibrium at some temperature, and the universe expands, the temperature scales simply as one over A. So it's not actually entirely obvious why this should be true. If you have a black body spectrum of radiation and you grow the universe, you still have a black body spectrum. That's the part that's not entirely obvious, but it's true. And the temperature scales as one over A. So T is proportional to one over A. So this ratio here, I can write as um, T at the end of inflation divided by T now. And so using that, and just plugging into here, I find that E to the N should be greater than H inflation over H now times T now, um, which is 2.7 degrees Kelvin, that's the temperature of the CMB, divided by T at the end of inflation. Okay? Now, um, how big is this right-hand side? Well, we know observationally, for reasons that I'll hopefully get to by the end of this lecture, that H inflation must be less than about 10 to the minus five times M Planck. That's something we know from, from observation. If inflation happened, it must have had an H less than this. H naught is about 10 to the minus 60 <coughs> times M Planck. What about T at the end of inflation? Well, it had to have been at least H inflation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, how do I know that? Well, again, as we're going to discuss, during inflation, there's a, a quantum effect which creates a temperature. So even if you sort of start in the vacuum with no particles, it doesn't last. The space produces radiation with a temperature that's of order H. And so the temperature at the end of inflation certainly can't be lower than that. It can actually be higher than that quite easily, uh, depending on what happens at the end of inflation, but it certainly can't be lower. Yes? Yeah, I'm not keep keeping track of changes in H for this. So this is just H during inflation, which I'm treating as constant. Yeah, I'm gonna come back and, and, uh, and talk about slow roll and, and so forth. But for this analysis, we don't need it. Okay, it's just, a, it's H during inflation, which, which doesn't change very much during inflation. Yeah, it might change by a factor of two or three or so, right? But, but, uh, but for this, at this level of squiggles, it really, its changes don't matter. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so, so um, uh, right, okay, so, so, so we'll put in the largest possible value for HI, 10 to the minus five times M Planck, the smallest possible value for TE, um, 
And, um, and what we get then is about 10 to the 27. Um, and so if we write that in, in terms of E or just take the log, it says that N should be greater than 62. Magic number. And so again, this is sort of the worst possible case in the sense that if I made H, HI smaller, this number would be smaller. If I made TE larger, it would also be smaller. So um, um, if N is bigger than 62, that's enough, no matter what um, the Hubble constant and the temperature are. But in many models, it's not necessary for it to be quite that large. Okay. So um, again, so what did we do here? We said we want to make omega k in the early universe very, very small. Um, it's so small that uh, although it increases from the early universe until now, it's still less than one today, as we know is the case. And as we said this morning, that requires that omega k in the early universe be extremely tiny. But inflation just does that. It makes omega k um, extremely tiny, and tiny enough if the number of folds is at least roughly 60. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so this solves the curvature problem. Um, it also solves the horizon problem, which should not be surprising because they're very closely related. So um, to explain that, we need to make, we need to add one, one ingredient, or it's not really one ingredient, but we need to uh, um, discuss the behavior of this particle horizon in a little more detail. Uh, so let's take the simplest possible model, <laughs> excuse me, simplest possible model. So um, we'll say that inflation begins at t equals ti, and then it ends um, at t equals t end, uh, which would be um, ti plus n over h. Um, and then, immediately after inflation ends, the universe becomes radiation dominated. So then it's radiation dominated. All the way from T end until T naught. Uh, so the first part of this is reasonably realistic. Um, in most inflation models, at least, the universe does become radiation dominated right after inflation ends. But of course, in the real universe, radiation gives way to matter, and then matter gives way to vacuum energy or dark energy. So I'm just ignoring those two. I'm ignoring matter and, and vacuum energy um, uh, just to make it easier. And then let me make one other simplifying assumption. Um, let's assume that we can see, we can observe the universe at T end. In the real universe, when we look at the cosmic microwave background, we're observing the universe at decoupling, when um, electrons are recaptured by protons, and the universe becomes transparent. But in this toy universe, we're going to see all the way back to the end of inflation. Okay, so the end of inflation is called reheating, um, and so what I'm, I'm doing is identifying reheating with last scattering. And again, I'm just doing this to try to, uh, to make the picture a little simpler. <coughs> okay, so now um, let me show you what's gonna happen and then I'll justify it. So this morning I drew a picture which showed how the particle horizon uh, behaves with time. I'm going to draw a slightly different picture. Well, it's almost exactly the same. Um, right. So the way to think about this picture, we're here. We live at time tau naught, which is t naught. I'll explain tau in a second. We look back in time along um, light cones. right? So we look back with photons, which propagate along these null geodesics. And then we observe the universe in here, 
Actually, really, we observe it only on this, the rim of this cone, but in principle, we could also see inside. So anyway, we, we observe the universe back at this time, at time tau end. Now, um, the horizon problem is that without inflation, so with just radiation domination, um, this slice here contains many uh, disconnected regions. Right, so if we were to go back further um, and assume that the universe was radiation dominated the whole way, then this part is disconnected from this part, is dis this part, this part. Okay, so there's many disconnected Hubble volumes in our past light cone, and yet they're all at the same temperature. Of course, this picture is wildly out of scale because there should be something like, um, uh, what was it, 10 to the 30 or something of these guys along this line. Okay, so, so in fact, these two lines should be extremely close together. All right. So now what happens if we add inflation? So let me keep this at the same level. Um, and um, here I'm gonna put uh, uh, the other two lines. So this one is gonna be not quite as far up. And then this one, it turns out, is gonna be right here. Very, very close, this is tau naught. And so now when we draw the past light cone, it's tiny and it fits easily inside one light cone on this tau initial surface. Okay, so, so our entire past light cone is contained within the future of just one point on the initial surface, as opposed to the future of many points as over here. All right, so now let's see how that happens. All I need to do is calculate these taus to justify this picture that I drew. <coughs> so let me tell you what tau is, first of all. Tau is just the integral dA over, over sorry, dt over A. And we might as well define it from T initial up to some time T. Primes on this. Okay. This is called the conformal time, and it's equal to delta R. So if I draw pictures where the vertical axis is tau and the horizontal axis is r, then light rays are at 45 degree lines because tau is plus or minus r is the equation for one of these light rays. Okay, so it's more convenient to draw things in terms of tau than in terms of t. Now we just need to calculate how much, what are these values of tau here um, in these two scenarios? Um, well, so we've already done it for the case of radiation domination. Maybe I need some more room, so let me go back over here. Yeah. I, I didn't start the meaning of the number of E-folds. The meaning of the number of E-folds you're asking about? Yeah. Good, yeah. So. Um, I just erased the scale factor, but let me write it again. So A um, is some A initial, E to the H T minus T initial. Um, so this is the radius of the universe, you can think of this. Um, and, um, and N is just this exponent. So it's just um, how large this exponent is at time T. Uh, <coughs> and so it tells you how big is the, um, how big is the radius of the universe. Right. How big is it compared to, to where it started at the beginning of inflation? It's bigger by a factor of e to the n. So each, each time 1 over h during inflation, the universe increases in size by a multiplicative factor of e. So after 1 e-fold, it's 2.7 times bigger. After 2, it's 2.7 squared, et cetera. Okay, so it's growing exponentially with time. Uh, let's see, so you're asking about that number 62 over there? Yeah, so th that, that's, the, that's the number. So this is if you want n of t here, here. Um, and um, this n over here, I wasn't very clear. This is n of t end. Okay, so it says that uh, at the end of inflation, there should have been at least this many e-folds of inflation. Yeah, that's the total number. 
Thank you. Um, okay, so, so, so let's calculate what happens to this tau with and without inflation. Okay, so no inflation. Then um, we know that tau is, uh, well, first A is um, So in this case, with no inflation, the universe is radiation dominated forever. So it uh, expands like t to the 1 half. And a at t initial should be a initial. So that's the right prefactor. Um, and so if we compute tau, uh, we get um, And I can rewrite this in a slightly nicer way as 1 over h initial a initial times the square root of t over t initial, where h initial uh, 1 over 2 times t initial. OK. Um, so that's without inflation. What about with inflation? So then um, we have a different uh, dependence for A. So A is AI e to the H T minus TI, as long as T is less than T end and greater than T initial. And after that, um, it's uh, AIE to the N, so that's its value at the end of inflation, times T over T end to the power of 1 half, greater than T end. So now let's compute tau. So tau is computation we just did um, times a small term. And then dropping this term here, which is small, uh, it, um, it picks up an extra term. So there's this guy, this first term here. And then plus something very similar to what we have there. So if we go to times close to today, so this is much bigger than this, we can neglect this as well. And then I can rewrite this as follows. And uh, the condition I derived for solving the curvature problem, which is somewhere over here, this one here, If you do a little algebra, you find that it guarantees that this term here is less than 1. Okay, so basically what it says is that there's very little conformal time uh, com compared to the conformal time between um, t initial and t end. So compared to the amount of conformal time that passes here, there's very little up here. Okay, so it says this amount of conformal time is much less than this, or less than this, doesn't have to be much less. And since the small rays are at 45 degrees, that guarantees that this past light cone is smaller than this future light cone. In other words, it guarantees that the part of the reheating surface we can see is smaller than the part that's contained within just the future light cone of one, one point. OK, so, so the same condition that solves the, the flatness problem solves the horizon problem. It means that every, everything we can see in the universe came from one initial point on this surface at the beginning of inflation. Questions about this? Yeah. 
What did I win? Oh, what if you, wait, sorry, what if I wait? Ah, yes, good question, yes, thanks. Um, yeah, if you wait, it depends on your future. So if your future is radiation dominated, you will see more and more of, of the universe because, um, well, this gets bigger and bigger. And eventually, or I should draw it over here, sorry. Eventually, you'll see more than one horizon volume and you'll see sort of past the beginning of inflation. Right, it's, it's, it's pretty intuitive that the further away you look, the further back in time you're looking, and that's what's happening here. If you wait longer, you can look further because the surface is sort of further back in time. So you're seeing further back in time. And, um, and yeah, eventually you see past the beginning of inflation and then you should see whatever crazy stuff was there before inflation started. That's if your future is radiation dominated or any decelerating phase. But in fact, the universe today is accelerating, not decelerating because of dark energy, which means we're entering a new phase of inflation. And it turns out that that screens us from ever seeing more than we already see. Even if we could wait a trillion years, we would barely see anything more than we already see. In fact, the CMB sky will get darker and darker exponentially. And, not only, and so not only will it get darker, it won't probe a larger region. So we live at the best possible time to be doing cosmology. You're lucky. All right, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so, so in the real world, um, well, there's, there's, there's still a fact though that, that as, you, as you wait, you'll see a bigger and bigger piece of the last scattering surface. So you're seeing things that are farther away, and therefore eventually you will see uh, perturbations that were there before inflation started. Right, so, so, so yeah, you're seeing the universe at a fixed time, you're right, but you're seeing it on larger scales, and that effectively means you're looking further back in time in this sense. Um, right. Is there another question? So, so th th this is just uh, tau, it's the integral of this. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's tau as long as t is less than te. All right, so, so I'm just performing this integral here. And uh, in this line, I've integrated up to a time t, which is less than te. So I'm only integrating that part there. And in this line, I get the contribution from here, which is mostly this piece, plus, uh, whatever I get from integrating that, okay, which is, which is here. Right, so, so, yeah, so this, so this is the scale factor at any time, and this is the tau corresponding to it at any time. Okay, so here it is, um, I mean, you can just take this if you want, but this is, this is uh, uh, for t less than te, this is for t bigger than te. Sorry, yeah. Is there any constraint from the num for the number of the foldings coming from having you no know, initial perturbation? Um, the question was whether there's a constraint on n, the number of e folds from initial perturbations. If the initial perturbations are very large, then they may prevent inflation from beginning at that time. So, in other words, when inflation begins, the initial perturbations can't really be larger than order one in some sense. And then um, you might need a few extra E folds to get rid of those, but it would just be a few. Remember, I, I assumed that omega K was order one, so that's already an order one perturbation. So not really, I've, I've pretty much put that in. Yeah, I, I think I'm answering your question, did I? Yeah, there was one up there. Case one, yes. Uh -huh. uh, 
Case one is, no, uh, k equals zero. I, I've, I've ignored curvature everywhere. Except, well, okay, I'm doing the same thing I did this morning. So as long as omega k is small, you can ignore it. When it gets to be larger than one, you shouldn't ignore it anymore. Um, but it's never larger than, 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 than order one in, in, in any of these calculations. Yeah. Um, if you want to include it, you can. It just makes the math uglier and it would take longer to write on the blackboard, but it won't change anything. Uh, H is roughly constant during inflation. We're gonna come back to that right now, yeah. Um, it changes slowly. Okay, so, so, um, so inflation solves the horizon and flatness problems in the sense that if you take a universe without it, uh, you would have to tune the initial conditions very precisely to get <coughs> what we see today. Um, but if you take a universe that does undergo inflation, you don't have to do any tuning. You can assume that there are order one variations in density and temperature on the initial slice and order one curvature and so on, and inflation gets rid of them for you. So it solves those problems. Um, but you might wonder whether it's too much of a good thing. Uh, after all, the universe we live in is not homogeneous or isotropic. I mean, just look around. Right? This room is neither homogeneous nor isotropic, fortunately. Um, and um, even if you look on, on larger scales, uh, so even if you look out past the scale of the Milky Way, there are galaxies in certain places. They're not smoothly distributed everywhere. And even if you look on very large scales, on the larger scales we can see, what you find is that uh, fluctuations in density divided by the average density are something like 10 to the minus five, or a few times 10 to the minus five. <coughs> so a few parts in 100,000. Now, um, if inflation lasted for too long, then whatever was there initially gets just erased with exponential efficiency. And so you might worry that there would be no fluctuations in density at all, or that they would become, that you would have to very carefully tune n, the number of e-folds, uh, to get this to turn out right. But it turns out that's not the case, and the reason it's not the case is related to Hawking radiation. So um, you've all heard that if you have a black hole, it has a horizon, and it radiates particles. It's not actually black. It glows very faintly. One way to understand this is that if you're standing, or rather hovering, near a black hole, you have to accelerate outwards to keep from falling in. Just like standing on the floor, you're actually accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. That's what an accelerometer would read. So similarly, to avoid falling into a black hole, you have to have a rocket which is, um, which is thrusting in, in, in this direction. So there's some rocket which is uh, pushing you that way. And that keeps you from falling in. And when you accelerate, you measure particles. This is a fact about quantum field theory that accelerated observers or accelerated particle detectors register the existence of particles even um, in a vacuum. Okay, so what, what does that have to do with anything? Um, well. If we were in exact de Sitter space, so if H did not depend on time at all during inflation, um, then there's a whole slew of coordinate systems you can write um, for de Sitter space time. Let me actually write the black hole coordinate system first. So this is <coughs> a Schwarzschild black hole. So that's the metric for a Schwarzschild black hole. We won't ever need it again. But notice that this coefficient is zero, and one, I mean, this coefficient is zero as well, and there's one over it, when R equals RS. RS is the radius of the black hole. Uh, the sitter space time, so that's like inflation with H exactly constant, has a metric um, which can be written like this. These are not the FRW coordinates. But they look a lot like a black hole in the sense that when R is equal to one over H, this coefficient vanishes and so does this one. When R is less than one over H, everything is normal. So it's like an inside out black hole. It describes the interior of an event horizon. <coughs> 
And if you want to avoid falling into that event horizon, then you have to accelerate towards the center. Okay? So you'll measure particles. So this is a hand wavy way of saying that um, in the center space, there's a temperature, a quantum temperature, just like there is for a black hole. And how big is it? What can, what can its value possibly be? Well, there's only one answer because uh, the center space time only has one parameter in the metric. Actually, there's only one answer here too. It's one over our Schwarzschild. There's only one answer here, it's h. So t to sitter, h, actually divided by two pi if you want the two pi, but basically it's h, okay? Um, all right, now, when black holes Hawking radiate, um, you say measure a particle outside, there must be an effect on the black hole by conservation of energy, right? If a particle has escaped, the black hole lost that mass. So it got smaller, and it also deformed in its shape. If you measure it in some particular position, then, well, it has some momentum, the black hole gets a kick, et cetera. Okay, so Hawking radiation has an effect on the black hole. And similarly, the center radiation has an effect on the universe. It changes it. So, um, in order to calculate effects like that, <coughs> we need a model for what is making the universe undergo this exponential expansion. We need to know why um, the scale factor behaves like this. So what's the density that's driving it? And so let me present the sort of simplest uh, model for that. Um, it's a scalar field, phi. It's called the inflaton. because it's the field that causes inflation. And um, <coughs> it's canonically coupled to gravity. So here I'm going to write an action. And I'm going to do some variations. If you're not familiar with um, uh, this kind of manipulation, I'll try to talk you through it. But I just need it to define some, to find some equations of motion. Okay, so that's the action. This part is the Einstein-Hilbert action. This is what gives you GR. This part is the action for the scalar field. And um, it's coupled to gravity because there's a g mu nu here and there's a square root of minus g here. Okay, so there are terms that involve g, the metric, times phi the field, and that means the field and gravity talk to each other. If you, uh, yeah, here I'm not gonna discuss the standard model or the Higgs or anything. Um, you can try to make the Higgs itself the inflaton. It doesn't work very well, but it's maybe possible. Um, and you can couple this to this, this can be an, an, a new field that's coupled to the standard model, that's fine as well as long as the coupling isn't too strong. If it's too strong, it'll mess up inflation. If it's not too strong, it's kind of good, actually. It helps it reheat. But um, yeah, uh, I'm, but I'm not gonna discuss the, the standard model. Um, right now, I just wanna explain how this can cause inflation. That's a good question. Um, it doesn't have to be a scalar field. Um, scalar fields are the simplest sort of fields in some sense. They don't have any spins. You don't have to worry about spin indices. It's easier to write on the board. Um, they also, can have um, expectation values which don't pick out any direction in space, so they don't break isotropy or homogeneity. Um, but it doesn't have to be a scalar. There are models of inflation where the thing that drives inflation is not a scalar. But I just wanted to focus on the simplest possible thing uh, to, show how, to show how it can happen. Okay. Um, so let's figure out what T mu nu is so that we can decide whether this can actually give rise to inflation. Um, <clears throat> so we can find T mu nu by uh, varying the action with respect to the metric and just the part of the action which um, depends on the scalar. The other part would give us Einstein's equations if we do this variation. Um, so if we do this, we get um, 
this. And there's an equation of motion for the scalar, which is um, So it's a little complicated, um, but we're going to assume homogeneity and isotropy. Yeah. Which one? Here? Here? Oh. Uh, not with this sign convention. So um, I think this is right with, with this sign. This is mostly minus. Uh, so I think it's right. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, so, um, so, uh, so these look a little complicated. But um, let's assume, as we did for the metric, homogeneity, meaning that phi is only a function of time and not a function of space. Then um, a lot of things simplify. So rho, which is t0, 0, is just 1 half phi dot squared uh, plus v of phi, then p which is minus TII with, with no sum, is 1 half phi dot squared minus V of phi. And all the other components of the stress tensor are 0. Um, and so W, P over rho, is 1 half phi dot squared minus V divided by 1 half phi dot squared plus v, okay? And so if we want w to be close to minus one, it means we want uh, phi dot squared to be small compared to v. If phi dot squared is small compared to v, then this is almost minus one. It's a little bit more positive than minus one. So that's what we need to arrange. We need to arrange that phi dot squared is not uh, important um, compared to v. And the equation of motion becomes just phi double dot plus 3h phi dot uh, plus or minus plus v prime. v prime means dv by d phi equals zero. If you look at this equation of motion, it's like the equation for a particle. If you think of phi as like x, it's like the equation of motion for a particle subject to a force minus dv by dx. Here's its acceleration with a friction term, which is proportional to h, right? This is like a positive friction term. That's the right sign for a friction term. It would slow the, the motion of the particle down. And that's also encouraging because, again, we don't want phi dot to be very large. We don't want the kinetic energy to be very large compared to the potential. And so it's good to have damping. That's going to slow down the velocity of the field. If this is damped enough, then uh, phi dot can be very small. And, um, and so it's possible for V to be more important than phi dot and for it to stay that way for a while. Okay, so we want something like a very, an overdamped um, harmonic oscillator or something. And in fact, we can make it literally a harmonic oscillator, or almost literally, if we choose V to be 1 half m squared phi squared. Okay, so this is the famous quadratic inflation. And um, so then V prime is, is phi. So this is almost exactly a damped harmonic oscillator. The only thing that makes it not quite is that h depends on v. Because remember, h squared is equal to rho. And rho sorry, h depends on phi. Because h squared is equal to rho, and um, uh, rho depends on phi over here. Okay? But uh, it'll be nearly constant, so it'll be nearly like a damped harmonic oscillator. All right. Um, good. So now. Uh, let's see if it's possible to make w close to minus 1. So is it possible for uh, phi dot squared to be small? <coughs> um, so what do we want? We want that... Um, we want to be able to ignore the acceleration term. Um, 
because in an overdamped oscillator, uh, you don't accelerate. Um, and we want to be able to ignore the kinetic energy. <coughs> and we also want h dot over h squared to be much less than one. I already mentioned this. This is really the condition that we need. This is the condition that says that h is changing very slowly during inflation. So we want all those things. Uh, this is a comma, yeah, these are, oh, up here. This is also a comma. Yeah, it should be much less than both of those things. Um, we should just be able to neglect this term in that equation of motion. Um, so we can check whether there exists a solution like this in a, in a tricky way. We just assume it exists uh, and then plug it back in and see whether it solves the equations. And if it does, we found it. So in other words, we can check if it's self-consistent to assume these things. And checking that is going to take a little bit of algebra. Um, so maybe I'm going to uh, skip over a little bit. You can do this very easily yourselves. Um, what you end up finding, if all the, for all these things to be true, what you need is that you need v prime over v squared um, So this thing is usually defined to be epsilon, and you want this to be much less than one. Dimensionless. Um, you need this, and you need uh, V double prime over V, one over eight pi G. So this is defined to be eta, and you also need this to be much less than one. Um, so if, uh, if both of these quantities are small, then all these things can be true. There exists a solution where all these things are true. Say again? Yeah, I'm, I'm ex What roles? Uh, what roles? Um, yeah, it's not a very good word. Um, it means that phi is changing with time slowly. So you're supposed to think of a ball rolling down a hill, but there's no rolling, there's no inert moment of inertia, but there's no angular momentum. It's just sliding, really. It should be called slow slide. But for some reason, it's called slow roll. Don't ask me why. Um, OK. So um, yeah, you can check with just some algebra that if these quantities are small, um, then um, if you plug this back in here, uh, you'll find a solution which satisfies all these conditions. Okay. Um, so, okay, so what this tells us is that if we have a potential V for which epsilon and eta are small, then um, the universe can undergo inflation. Um, so, first of all, um, let's see uh, whether this can be true for, for m squared phi squared. So um, if I take v to be one half m squared phi squared, then v prime is m squared phi. So v prime over v squared times one half times one over eight pi g is, uh, let's see, so there's a one half and then we have m squared phi squared, and then we have one half m squared phi squared squared. And so we should get uh, two over phi squared. Um, and one over eight pi g is otherwise known as m Planck squared. This is the so-called reduced Planck mass. Um, okay, so this is epsilon. So you see that if you want epsilon much less than one, then phi has to be greater than m Planck. And so this is a so-called large field inflation model. It's an inflation model in which the infiltron field phi must be larger than m Planck. That's not necessarily a problem. It may be. It's controversial whether it's an issue or not. Um, but in any case, that's what the math tells us. <laughs> so now let's try to compute n at t end, the, the total number of e faults that we get out of this. 
So the number of E folds, the integral of H dt. Um, so here I'm gonna keep the time dependence of H, so I'm writing it as an integral. Okay, because that's really what, uh, what defines n. And um, now what do we mean by T end? Well, inflation will end when epsilon is no longer small. So let's say it ends when epsilon is equal to one. Okay, so that's a bit arbitrary, that definition, but it won't matter much if we choose it to be one or one half, uh, it won't make much difference. Okay, so then um, n is the integral up to the time when epsilon is equal to one, starting from, um, from t initial of h dt. Now, um, uh, <coughs> again, I can go through the algebra. Um, first of all, we can rewrite h dt as h d phi over phi dot by a change of variable. So now we're integrating in phi from some initial phi up to the phi where epsilon is equal to one. Um, and h is proportional to the square root of v, which is proportional to phi. So if you go through this, it ends up being one over two m Planck squared times the integral of phi d phi. So it's phi squared over four m Planck squared. Now, um, evaluated from phi initial to phi end, which is the phi where epsilon equals one. Okay. Um, so where's epsilon? Uh, oh, down here? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's positive for this one, but you're right. That, that, that's really the condition, thanks. Okay, so what is this phi end? Well, it's the phi where epsilon is equal to one, so it's phi end is the square root of two and Planck. And so what I get here then is phi initial squared over four and Planck squared minus one half. So you see this definition of phi end contributed just this one half. If we had changed it to epsilon equals one half instead of one, it would have been something slightly different, but it barely makes a difference. And so if I want n greater than 62, this implies that phi initial should be greater than about 60 in m Planck, roughly. And so what happens in the solution, here's our potential, and um, here I'm gonna draw V of phi versus phi. So there's some value here, which is uh, root two m Planck, and over here also, which is minus root two m Planck. In here, there's no inflation, so whoops, in this region in here, uh, epsilon is greater than one, and there's no inflation. But here, epsilon is less than one, and also over here. And so here there's inflation, and actually here there's also inflation. You can, you can inflate on either side of this thing. It's symmetric, so it doesn't matter. And if you start far enough up, like down here at 15 and Planck or so, then by the time you roll down to here, the universe will have expanded by a factor of e to the 62. If you start further up, then it'll expand by an even larger factor, which is fine. Okay. All right. Well, so in five minutes we can talk about perturbations. Um, ten. Ah.
perfect, no problem. Yes. Um, okay, so let's talk about perturbation. So, so far, everything has been completely homogeneous. Um, <coughs> and, um, well, it would be bad if everything was completely homogeneous because then there'd be no stars or galaxies or people. And we need to generate some perturbation somehow. And really, the key is going to be this formula for n over here. So um, let me give you a preview of how this will work. You see here that n depends on the initial value of phi. The further away from the origin you start, the more inflation you get. So imagine that in some part of the universe during inflation, there's a random jump. So this was the homogeneous value of phi. But somewhere in the universe, an, uh, phi gets a little bit of a kick. So not everywhere, but in one Hubble volume, phi gets a little bit of a kick either up or down this potential, just randomly. If it's moved down its potential, then inflation will end sooner. If it's moved up its potential, then inflation will end later in that region. So what you'll end up with is a universe which ended inflation either earlier or later in some part. And if you end inflation earlier, then that part of the universe is effectively older than what's around it. And since density decreases with time during radiation domination or matter domination, being older means being less dense. So you produced an under density. And exactly the same thing works in reverse. If inflation ends later, because you fluctuated up the potential, then that part of the universe is effectively younger and therefore it will have higher density. So if these fluctuations are happening randomly all the time during inflation, you'll end up with a patchwork of regions where uh, the density isn't exactly the same as you move from region to region. Okay? So that's really all it is. It's just that uh, this field cannot be perfectly homogeneous. If you remember a little bit of quantum mechanics, it's not possible to have a definite value of x, because if you have a definite value of x, then p would have infinite uncertainty. In quantum field theory, the scalar phi is like x. It can't have a definite value. It must have some uncertainty in its value. Otherwise, it would have infinite momentum, which would mess this up in a different way. So it's impossible for phi to have a perfectly well-defined value. If you measure phi, you won't always get the same answer. You won't always get the classical average value. Yeah. Sorry, wh wh why is quantum mechanics not, not valid? Because we are in super Planckian scale, so. Ah, super Planckian, uh, okay. So, uh, uh -huh. Quantum mechanics uh -huh. is just uh, uh -huh. in places because uh -huh. it's not um, valid. Mm. And um, quantum mechanics, so, so uh, the, thing, the second thing is uh, even if quantum mechanics they have a face, they are suppressed because. Yeah, so, so the second part of your comment, which was that quantum fluctuations are small, um, is true. And we're gonna find out in a minute how big they are. They are small. Um, the first part of your comment, which was that you can't trust quantum mechanics in a super Planckian regime. Um, right, so I referred to this controversial uh, issue that phi has to be bigger than M Planck. <coughs> um, the counterpoint is that although the value of the field is bigger than M Planck, the energy density is way below M Planck. So there's, it's not clear that there's a problem there. Um, nothing obviously breaks down in effective field theory or even in um, perturbative quantum gravity. So it's not at all obvious that there's an issue and it's because the value of the field is not really something that, uh, that feeds directly into the action. Right? What's in the action is the integral of the derivative of the field squared. It's the kinetic energy or V of phi. And all of those terms are much less than M plex to the fourth. So this means that quantum gravity corrections, at least at the perturbative level, are all very small. And quantum field theory corrections are perfectly fine. It's a free field theory. 
So um, anyway, I don't really want to delve too far into that because we don't have to do this. I just picked m squared phi squared because it's the simplest example. But we could choose a more complicated potential in which phi doesn't have a super Planckian value. And um, it wouldn't affect uh, much of anything else that I'm saying. Um, but your second comment about quantum fluctuations being small is, um, is very prescient. Um, so let's find out how, uh, how big they are. Um, OK. Um, <coughs> so yeah, let me do this, since we, we have five minutes, let me do it very quickly in a quick way. Um, right, so, so, so I said that if there's a random variation in phi in some Hubble volume, then that will either delay or advance when inflation ends in that region of the universe. Um, so how big would you expect delta phi to be? This is the fluctuation in phi with respect to this classical homogeneous background that we've been describing. How big would you expect this to be per Hubble volume, per Hubble time? Well, you probably know the answer. There's only one scale. It has to be of order h. No other possible answer because there's no other scale in this problem. Um, well, there's m, but uh, m has to be much less than h. And we didn't we didn't show that, but it's it's a consequence of these uh, slow roll conditions. Um, <clears throat> so um, so delta phi has to be of order h. Um, all right. So so what does this mean? Well, we have that formula for n over there. And if I just ignore that one half, um, it's one over four m Planck squared times phi squared. So delta n is one over two m Planck squared times phi delta phi. <coughs> and um, <coughs> plugging in these values, so during inflation, phi is of order 10 times m Planck or so. Um, delta phi is h. So I get a few times h over m Planck. Okay? And um, I told you before that, first of all, observationally, this quantity must be less than 10 to the minus 5, less than or of order 10 to the minus 5. So that's an observational fact. But it's also true for the reason that you pointed out, that uh, this had better be small, because otherwise, indeed, quantum mechanics does break down. If h is of order m Planck, then um, the curvature of this uh, of, of this universe during inflation is of order m Planck. You can't trust classical gravity. All bets are off. Um, nothing here would make sense. So we must be in a regime where h, which is the inverse radius of curvature, inverse radius of this, of this universe, um, uh, should be, uh, uh, h should be smaller than m Planck. So h over m Planck is small. Um, and then it's true that, that indeed this is a small fluctuation. So delta n is much less than 1. Okay, so the typical change in how many e-folds inflation lasts is much less than one. Now, how do, we translate it as, how do we translate delta n into something observable? Well, um, we have our background metric. Which looks like this. And now, um, let me replace a with a plus delta a. Like this. And then I'm just going to keep the first term not the delta a squared term. So this delta a can be a function of position as well as a function of time. Um, uh, and it describes <coughs> the perturbation away from, um, so delta a equals zero is, is the classical background that we started with. Now, um, how big is this delta a over a? Delta a over a, um, I can rewrite as a dot over a delta t. So this is just h delta t. And h delta t is delta n, because remember that n is the integral of h dt. So this delta n is exactly um, 
without the two, is exactly this perturbation in the metric here. I can write this another way. Um, I can also write this as h delta phi over phi dot. Again, just using differentials. Phi dot is d phi by dt. And so this is another standard formula uh, for the size of the perturbations. Um, <clears throat> and now what we've seen is that for this m squared phi squared model, um, so this is true for m squared phi squared, um, that this is a few times h over m Planck. Okay, so the bottom line is that <coughs> these fluctuations in phi, um, which are of order h, give rise to fluctuations in the metric, um, which are of order uh, h delta phi over phi dot, uh, or h over m Planck, in the case of m squared phi squared. So it's not, oh, I should warn you, this is only for m squared phi squared. So in a model with small field, for instance, um, it would not be h over m and Planck, H would be much smaller, and this could still be the same size. It's because phi dot would be smaller. Um, but, um, but for M squared phi squared, it's, it's, uh, it's that simple. Um, and yeah, so so, um, so so long as there are any variations in the value of phi, <coughs> and as long as they're of order H and not, say, much smaller or much larger, um, then you expect to find perturbations in the metric of about this order. And in fact, these perturbations in the metric can be directly translated into uh, perturbations to the temperature of the CMB or perturbations in the density of, um, uh, of dark matter or, for that matter, clusters of galaxies and so forth in large-scale structure. So you've been learning about um, large-scale structure where there's a power spectrum, a primordial power spectrum of perturbations, which then evolves in lots of interesting ways. That primordial power spectrum is what this is producing. Um, so if I had a little more time, I would translate this into momentum space and show you how it produces a scale invariant or nearly scale invariant spectrum of perturbations. But, um, but we're out of time. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>